What's going on all of my brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Critical care nurses are gonna be faced with ethical and legal issues on a daily basis as they practice in critical care. It's important to know the relevant ethical and legal principles so that you can make informed decisions in difficult situations. In this video, we're gonna talk about a few of them. So let's talk about the different agencies as well as statutes that govern nursing practice. We start by looking at the Nursing Practice Act, also known as NPA. This is the primary legal document that governs nursing practice in most states. The NPA is a set of law that defines the scope of practice for nurses, requires nursing licensure, establishes standards for nursing schools, delegates the enforcement of power when it comes to state agencies, and establishes the standards of care that nurses must provide to patients. We also have the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, also known as NCSBN. This is the body that creates the rules and regulations for nursing practice throughout the United States. The NCSBN also administers the National Licensure Examination. That is the examination you took in order to become a registered nurse or a practical nurse, right? That is the... Um, the governing body that administers that test. What I will tell you is it's truly important to know what is within your scope of practice, especially when you're becoming a brand new nurse. Because depending on the state that you live in, the scope of practice is going to look a little bit different. For example, in the state of Florida, registered nurses cannot push IV propofol. We can hang it and give it as an infusion, however, we cannot push. We typically give IV propofol in situations of bedside procedures. That's where you're gonna see it a majority of the time. The physician is going to say, drop this many um, cc's of this medication. And then sometimes physicians can say, oh, I'm standing right here, go ahead and push it. Absolutely not. If you live within the state of Florida, I don't know about other states, I can't speak to them, but if you live within the state of Florida, it is outside of our scope of practice to push propofol. Don't do it. Hand it to the physician, have them do it. At the end of the day, you don't want to lose that license. We all went through the same nursing school. We all went through the same licensure exam. You don't want to lose that license because you were not following your scope of practice. Sometimes a complaint can be filed against a nurse. It happens, not all the time, but it does happen. The NCSBN will investigate the complaint and take disciplinary action if they feel it is necessary. They can also revoke a, nursing's, a nurse's license if they determine that the nurse has committed a serious misconduct after meeting certain requirements that fall under their guidelines. In addition to the NPA as well as the NCSBN, other federal and state laws also impact nursing practice. So for example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, also known as HIPAA, is a federal law that protects patient privacy by regulating how health information can be used as well as disclosed. As a critical care nurse, it's really truly important that you verify who has access to the patient's information prior to actually sharing it and communicating it. It's really, really important to know because as we know, there's a lot of times when people call to get patient information that don't need to have patient information. Sometimes these can be long lost family members that these people haven't spoken to in a very long time. It could be friends. Sometimes employers call to see what's going on with the patient, which is to me just unacceptable unless there's some kind of personal relationship there and they were allowed to have that information. But yeah, sometimes employers call, sometimes uh, neighbors call. So it's really important that you know who is going to have the information. We usually establish this by establishing a code. So what you'll see in most ICUs is there'll be like a four digit code that the family members uh, create, or it's part of their medical record number in some way that we provide to the family members. So that way we know that the person we're speaking to on the other end of the phone is the person who should be getting the information versus somebody who should not. So what are some of the most common ethical and legal issues that you're going to see as a critical care nurse? As a critical care nurse, we kind of deal with these you know, not necessarily daily, but a lot of the times we deal with these situations. End of life decisions, huge in the ICU. Informed consent versus implied consent is something you'll also see. We'll talk about that. 
patient confidentiality, as well as decision making for incompetent patients. What does that look like if the patient can't make their own decisions? Let's break each one of these down so we can get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. So starting with end of life decisions, as critical care nurses, we're going to encounter this ethical issue all the time. So for example, critical care nurses may be asked to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment from a patient or the patient's proxy who is terminally ill or has an irreversible condition that is taking place. Withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment means that the nurse will not provide any medical interventions that are designed to prolong life. This can include anything such as CPR, artificial ventilation, or artificial nutrition, as well as hydration. Withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatment is a difficult decision that has to be made by the patient's next of kin or proxy, or sometimes even the patient themselves. It's important to remember that the patient always has the right to refuse treatment. No matter how much we educate and explain and provide feedback in regards to what we feel would be best in regards to their care, patients ultimately have the right to refuse treatment and uh, the things that you can provide. It's just, it's part of their bill of rights. If you were ever in a situation where you're asked to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment, it's important to consult with your supervisor or another ethical resource, such as your risk manager at your hospital to make sure that you're making the appropriate, um, you're doing the appropriate thing by the patient and you're also following the guidelines as well as the protocols of the facility that you're working at. So another common ethical issue that critical care nurses encounter is patient confidentiality. We talked about a little bit before with HIPAA. HIPAA protects patient confidentiality by regulating how health information can be used and disclosed. So as a critical care nurse, you have access to very sensitive patient information. It's important to remember that this information is confidential and should only be shared with those who have a legitimate need to know what is documented inside the patient's chart and what is happening with the patient's condition. If you were ever in a situation where you were unsure if you should actually share this information with someone, it's important to first consult the chart regarding what kind of healthcare proxy is in place currently, and second, consult with your supervisor or your ethical resource, such as your risk manager, if a proxy has yet to be determined. I'm going to be very honest with you. This is huge in the ICU because a lot of times patients come in not knowing that they are going to become critically ill. So there is no advanced directives or living wills or anything that is set in place in case a patient is unable to make their healthcare decisions. We're going to talk about that in a couple slides, but it's really important that you follow up with your risk manager if a next of kin has not been determined or if a healthcare proxy has not been determined because there are a certain set of people or Uh, guidelines that you have to follow in order to make that decision or find the person that can make that decision. So we're going to talk about the difference of informed consent and implied consent. We're first going to start with informed consent. So informed consent means that the patient or their proxy has been fully informed of the risks, benefits, and alternatives to a proposed treatment and has been given permission to the provider to provide that treatment treatment or that procedure. As a critical care nurse, you're often going to be involved in obtaining informed consent from patients or their proxies. It's important to remember that informed consent must be obtained prior to any kind of medical intervention taking place, even if the patient is unable to communicate their permissions. Okay, so that's reaching out to their healthcare proxy to say, hey, this patient needs to have a blood transfusion or this patient needs to have a surgery. Before you can provide surgery or a blood transfusion and the patient is considered stable, they might be critically ill, but they're stable, the patient or the healthcare proxy has to make the determination if they want to have these things done. If the patient still has questions regarding their treatment and their options, it's important to have the person who provided that original discussion come back and speak with the patient or the proxy before you obtain signatures. Never obtain a signature if the patient or their proxy still has unanswered questions. Because ultimately what you're doing is you're stating that the patient and proxy understands fully the treatment options that are available and that they agree to it. 
you are not providing any of that information to them. The only thing we do as nurses is witness the patient's signature. Everything else is discussed by the provider or whoever's doing the procedure. So as nurses, we're not providing risks and benefits and alternative treatments. No, we're not having that discussion. The provider has to have that discussion. And once all questions are answered and both parties are in agreement, then they sign the paper and we witness the signature as the person is signing the paper stating that they agree to it and that is their signature. That is all we're doing. So please, please, please make sure that if you ever have a patient that has additional questions or they just don't understand something, they don't feel comfortable, have the person that had the original discussion come back. They usually don't want to, but they need to. <laughs> have them come back, finish that conversation, and at that point, they can make a decision if they want to have it done or if they don't. Sometimes there's times where we have to get consent and it's implied consent. So with implied consent, this is when a patient is unable to provide consent and there is an emergency situation occurring. In these cases, it's important to still document what happened and why implied consent was used in the patient's chart. This traditionally happens with, uh, within the emergency department. You're gonna see it all the time when a patient comes in with cardiac arrest or some other kind of life-threatening situation where they might not be able to make an informed decision, right? They might not be awake. They might not be competent enough to make that decision. We might not know who the healthcare proxy is. We might not know if there's any kind of advanced directives on board or any kind of living will. In those situations, it's implied that the patient wants us to save their life. So in those situations, we provide those things. We provide the CPR, we provide the medical treatment, we provide the procedures in order to save the patient's life because they are unable to make their own decisions, but it is an emergency situation that could ultimately lead to cardiac arrest or death and that is why as nurses, we get implied consent in those situations as opposed to informed consent. Hopefully that kind of cleared up the differences between when we would use informed and when we would use implied. So let's talk about the last ethical issue that we see most commonly, and that is decision making for incompetent patients. So incompetent patients are those who cannot make decisions for themselves due to some kind of mental incapacity or cognitive impairment. Persons can establish their healthcare surrogates or wishes through a variety of different documents. These documents can include advanced directives, durable power of attorney, and living will. So what are the differences? An advanced directive is a directive of legal documents that state a person's wishes regarding their medical care at the event that they are unable to communicate those wishes themselves. A durable power of attorney for healthcare is a document that designates another person to make healthcare decisions on the patient's behalf in the event that they are unable to do so. And then lastly, the living will is a document that states the person's wishes regarding any use of life-sustaining treatments in the event that they are unable to communicate those wishes themselves. So there has to be something in place. If you uh, have a patient or if you are a patient or if you are thinking about creating this, which I highly recommend that you create this now while you're still competent and you're able to do so because we never know what tomorrow brings or what even today might bring. Um, it's really important to know who, if you're going to have a durable power of attorney in regards to your health care, who that person is, and that they truly understand your wishes. A lot of times as healthcare professionals, we choose not to choose our families, because as we know, families can make very emotional decisions on our behalf that might not necessarily um, fit within what we had defined in our advanced directives or our living will. So sometimes as nurses, we pick other nurses, right? And if you're very close to somebody, that's completely up to you. If you still want to pick a family member, that's completely up to you. It's really who you believe will actually carry out your medical wishes in an event that you're unable to do so yourself, okay? If a patient is deemed incompetent, a healthcare proxy will need to be appointed if none of these documents are available to us, right? Sometimes we have patients that come in that weren't expecting to become critically ill. That happened a lot during the COVID pandemic where people were not expecting to have these negative um, experiences with the COVID virus. And in those situations, we had to develop a healthcare proxy using a standard set of guidelines. Um, every state's a little bit different, but I'm going to give you the standard set of guidelines in regards to how we 
look at healthcare proxy and how we make that determination of who we contact first if somebody is available within those guidelines. So let's break each one of those down so that way we can have a better understanding of what that's gonna look like if we run into this situation as critical care nurses. So if a healthcare proxy has not been appointed, the decision-making process falls to the next of kin. The next of kin is different depending on each state statutes in regards to the issue. However, the order of next of kin typically goes as follows. We start with the patient's spouse or domestic partner. That is the first person that we try to get in contact with making medical decisions on behalf of the patient. If neither one of those are available, then we look at the consensus of all adult children. <laughs> this can get really messy <laughs> if you've got multiple adult children because all of them have to agree right, or, or have a general consensus on what it is that they want done. So yes, consensus of all adult children are next if we don't have a spouse or domestic partner. If we don't have any children or adult children, then we go to a parent. So your mother or your father will ultimately be making the decisions on behalf of you if you're unable to make those decisions, right, or your patient's unable to make those decisions. If both parents are gone or we're unsure of where they are and we can't get a hold of them, then we start looking at siblings. So do you have any brothers or sisters at that point that can make any decisions for you? If all of those resources are not available, our last um, per people that we try to reach out to is going to be some kind of other relative, whether that's an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, um, some other kind of relative, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, you know, whatever the case may be. And then we also start looking at close friends. So I have been in situations where I've cared for patients that did not have a spouse or domestic partner. They had no children, both their parents were dead, and they had no siblings, they were only child. And the only person that they knew um, was a neighbor that they were very close, they lived together for 30 plus 30 years, um, right next door to each other. And that was unfortunately who we had to use as a healthcare proxy because this particular patient came in and was not expecting to become critically ill and had nothing in place, no advanced directives, no um, healthcare power of attorney, no living will, nothing was in place. And um, that poor neighbor had to make decisions on behalf of this patient. So really, it's really, really important that you establish those things now because we never expect to get sick or ill, but it's always good to have something in place in case we need to use it in the future. So now I'm gonna put my lawyer cap on, which I'm not a lawyer, I'm not providing any um, legal advice. I wanna say this as a disclaimer before I start moving into laws and statutes, is I'm not a lawyer. But I do know a little bit about the law in regards to the practice of nursing as well as our scope of practice. So that is why I wanted to have this discussion because these are things that you could potentially encounter um, with our patients if we're not following the appropriate protocols. So there are several different types of laws that affect nursing, including criminal law, civil law, there's also nursing malpractice and vicarious liability. So let's break each one of these down to get a better understanding of what falls within each of these categories and how we could potentially become affected by it. So we're gonna start with criminal law. Criminal law is any public law that is enacted by the government in order to protect the public. So for example, criminal laws against nursing can include murder, robbery, fraud, intentional assault and battery, or negligent homicide. If a nurse is convicted of any of these things, then the penalty will be loss of liberty, meaning jail time, and most likely you're gonna lose your license. And then next we have civil law. So civil law is any private law that is enacted by the government in order to protect citizens from harm. So examples of civil nursing law can include negligence by a professional, also known as malpractice. And the penalties for civil law usually are some kind of monetary uh, reimbursement for damages, as well as potentially losing your nursing license. So let's talk nursing malpractice. I think this is gonna be the biggest one in regards to nursing that is um, affects us the most. So nursing malpractice is any professional misconduct negligence or error on the part of the nurse that results in patient injury. This is usually filed by a patient and or their family in some kind of civil court. In order to be found guilty 
of nursing malpractice, it must be proven that the nurse deviated from the standard of care and that this deviation resulted in patient injury. This is why it is so important that you understand your nursing scope of practice as well as the hospital's policies and procedures so that you can cover yourself in situations like this. The nurse becomes a defendant at which time he or she will need to get legal representation. There will be a discovery phase with lots of written inquiries and answers from both parties followed by a deposition, which is some kind of oral testimony. In these cases, eventually, some of them will go to trial and some of them might stay within mediation. If it goes to trial, there has to be some kind of weight behind that lawsuit where a jury is ultimately going to decide whether a nurse is guilty or not guilty. I think one of the biggest nursing malpractice lawsuits that we can think of in modern day is the Redonda Vaught uh, lawsuit that was brought against her with the, um, the nursing malpractice suit in regards to administering a medication that ultimately led to a patient's death. Were there issues with the hospital's way of performing certain procedures? Absolutely. Was Redonda also liable for her actions of what she did? Absolutely. However, I felt that, I shouldn't say I felt, but I feel, I guess I feel, I feel like there should have been more in regards to the hospital having to make policy changes and be also being held accountable in addition to her. So there's a lot of things that you have to take in consideration when you are providing nursing practice. You need to make sure that you're taking your time and that you're administering the right medication to the right patient every single time following orders, following your hospital's policies and procedures, as well as understanding your hospital's scope of practice. It's truly, truly important. It's going to save you in the long run, and it's also going to protect your license. We're gonna take a closer look at the different kind of nursing malpractices within this scope of uh, law, but I just really wanted to hit it home again that it's truly important for you to understand your role as a nurse so that you're not held liable for these things in the future if you're following your scope of practice as well as following the hospital's policies and procedures. So a couple different uh, elements that fall under the nursing malpractices duty breach of duty, causation, as well as damages. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So within a nursing malpractice, we have duty, and that is determined as a legal responsibility between two or more people. There is a contractual agreement between a patient and the nurse or healthcare provider. Duty regarding a specific nurse is determined by the name found within the patient's medical record. That's when you go inside the medical record and chart, right? If the nurse's responsibility is to provide a standard of care as defined by the NPA, NCSBN, or employer policies, this is considered duty. Then we have a breach of duty. Once duty has been established, the plaintiff, that's the person that is initially filing the lawsuit or complaint, must show that the nurse violated their responsibilities. Negligence is defined as an action or a lack of action on the part of the nurse that does not meet the expected standard of care and results in a patient's injury. This can either be an action by the nurse that uh, they, they took to cause harm or an action that the nurse should have taken and didn't, which resulted in the patient being injured. Negligence can be broken down by either ordinary or gross negligence. So with ordinary negligence, this is defined as any action or lack of action on the part of the nurse that is not intentional and results in patient injury. So for example, this could be if a nurse fails to wash their hands before interacting with a patient. They touched a surface that had MRSA on it and then went and did wound care without washing their hands. And now there's this huge wound MRSA situation that ultimately caused injury to the patient. Okay, that's ordinary negligence. Then we have gross negligence, 
which is defined by any action or lack of action on the part of the nurse that is intentional and results in patient injury. So this is when it's intentional, okay? An example of this could be is if the nurse gave the patient the wrong medication intentionally, okay? So sometimes medication errors did happen. And I think one of the things that the Redonda Vaught case brought about was people were scared to now state that they made an error. Um, what I will tell you is that medical errors help the system recognize if there is a process with the system that needs to be changed, or if there's a process, process with a unit that needs to be changed, or maybe they need to uh, figure out how to not put medications that look exactly the same next to each other. Whatever the case may be, that is the reason that we report medical errors so that we can make future changes so that we can prevent it from happening again. Next, we move on to causation, and this is defined as the link between the nurse's negligence and the patient's injury. That means that the plaintiff must show that it is more likely than not that the nurse's negligence was the cause of that patient's injury. And then lastly, we have damages. So damages are those losses that are suffered by the plaintiff as a result of the defendant's negligence. This can be either economic damages, which are quantifiable, such as medical bills, or we could even have non-economic damages, which are non-quantifiable, such as pain and suffering, okay? So it's either quantifiable by the medical bills or it's non-quantifiable by the patient's continued pain and suffering. Ultimately, the courts must decide how the plaintiff can be made whole if the nurse is ultimately found liable. So again, the best way for nurses to avoid any kind of legal or ethical issue is to always follow your standard care of practice, know your scope of practice, and follow your hospital's policies and procedures. And lastly, we're gonna take a closer look at vicarious liability, which is when an employer is held responsible for the actions of their employees. This is huge, especially within our nursing practice. Additional elements related to vicarious liability include respondeat superior, corporate liability, negligent supervision, and the rule of personal liability. So let's break each one of these down. So you have respondeat superior, which is a legal doctrine that states have to follow in regards to employers being responsible for the actions of their employees. This means that if an employee commits an act while they are on a job, the employer can be held liable as well. This does not apply to temporary personnel or typical physicians. Be careful if you are a travel nurse or if a physician asks you to perform a procedure outside of your scope of practice. We talked about that before with the propofol, right? It's really important for you to note I bring in travel nursing into this because a lot of times you are traveling to other states in which you don't know what their scope of practice or what their laws look like. So it's really important that you have some kind of maybe nursing malpractice behind you or that you really truly understand the hospital's policies and procedures as well as their laws so that you're following what you should be following within that state. We also have things such as corporate liability is when a corporation is held legally responsible for the actions of their own unresponsible conduct. This can be a result of an action or a decision made by upper management. So for example, this includes floating nurses who are not competent in a specific specialty to that acuity or injuries that occur due to being chronically understaffed. I think that's like the biggest thing that's happening within the healthcare industry right now is the chronic understaffing that is taking place. The other big thing is floating nurses. So because of the chronic understaffing that's taking place throughout the country, we're floating nurses to different units that they might not necessarily be competent in. You wouldn't want to send a medical surgical trained nurse to the cardiovascular ICU and expect them to be able to handle a fresh post-op cabbage patient. 
it's not going to happen, right? So you really want to make sure wherever it is that you're floating to and you're being asked to perform certain things that they're within your scope of knowledge based on what you were trained to do. So that way you don't um, unintentionally harm a patient. Next, we have negligent supervision. This is when a supervisor fall, I'm sorry, fails to supervise people under their direction reasonably. So for examples, this includes that nurse that is being floated to an ICU acuity without the appropriate training or being assigned an invasive procedure that the nurse is not familiar with without supervision. Same thing we talked about before. That's negligent supervision is when that supervisor fails to supervise the people that is working underneath them reasonably. And then lastly, we have personal liability. And this is when an individual is held legally responsible for their own actions. So as a nurse, we are responsible for making decisions by our specialized education that we received, the experience, as well as the training that we received. It's really important that nurses question every order for relevance that they do not seem or they don't think that are safe or that we seek clarifications on orders that we don't understand. So that's why I was saying when you're speaking with a physician and the physician is rattling off orders to you and you're, you're unable to get all of them or you're questioning a patient that has a blood pressure of 70 over 30 and the physician wants you to start giving morphine. Why am I giving morphine to this patient that's get this low blood pressure doesn't make any sense. Why are they on nitro? Why are we continuing the nitro? You're going to start questioning everything it is in regards to the patient care that you provide. So that is your personal liability. We have to be held liable for the decisions that we make on our own and the processes and procedures that we provide to our patients. So it is absolutely 100% necessary to question every order. Now, as I say that, it doesn't mean to go to a physician and say, why are we giving this? Why are we giving that? Have a reason as to why you think that it's not necessary before you approach a physician. Or you can always seek clarification, like I spoke about before, and say, why would we give this? But don't go up to somebody and say, I'm not doing this. This shouldn't fall within the patient's care. You have to provide a reason why. <laughs> I think that's where nurses sometimes get into trouble is because we don't have the why. We always have the no, but we don't have the why. So make sure you understand the why and use your critical judgment and critical thinking before making that decision. But absolutely, as a nurse, you're going to have to question everything. You're going to have to look at things that come from pharmacy. That's going to be huge within the ICU. Sometimes pharmacy to air is human. They send things that are incorrect. Maybe they send you um, a medication that is double the dosage of what it was before and they didn't realize it. And now you've provided the patient double what they were receiving before because the concentration was different. So it's really, really important that you take the time. I know that the ICU is hectic. You're going to be running around. You're going to be trying to figure things out. You really have to take the time to look at every single thing that you do because ultimately, Ultimately, we're held personally liable for the care that we give. So I just provided you with a whole bunch of legal stuff and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know if this is for me. It's okay. I'm going to give you the tips on how to handle these situations effectively. So we're going to do it in one of four ways. Independent nursing judgment, standards of care, autonomy of practice, and research issues regarding life support measures. So this is how we handle these situations effectively. So when it comes to independent nursing judgment, this is when nurses make those decisions based on their education, experience, and training for their patient care. We want to follow facility and hospital policies and that help govern us in regards to our practice. And we also want to uh, advocate for our patients and question any medical orders that may not necessarily make sense. So make sure you know your scope of practice, make sure you're following your hospital's policies and procedures, because that ultimately helps govern you with the hospital, and make sure that you question things that don't make sense in regards to the patient's care before you perform them so you can seek clarification on why patients are receiving certain treatments um, versus others. Next, we have standards of care. So critical care nurses may work independently without direct supervision of a physician as long as they are following protocols and standards of nursing care 
that are provided by the facility. So read your scope of practice. Know what you can do and what you cannot do. The document is lengthy because we have a lot of responsibility as nurses. Make sure you understand what you can do and what you cannot do and don't do the things that fall outside your scope. Then we have autonomy of practice. So understand what falls under your autonomy of practice when it comes to things like informed consent, right? So if we have a nurse who's gonna witness a patient signing consent for an upcoming procedure, as a nurse, we're only witnessing the signature as it is up to the person providing the information regarding the treatment and the procedure to discuss the risks, benefits, and alternatives to that procedure. We do, we walk away from that conversation. The only thing as nursing we're doing is witnessing that the patient is signing the consent form, okay? So if they have any questions, like we said before, redirect them back to the person that originally provided them with the information. We are not providing them with any additional information because they truly need to understand what are the risks, benefits, and alternatives to what is going to happen to them if they choose that procedure. They have the right to refuse treatment, 100% but we ultimately are not helping them make that decision. We're just witnessing the signature. And then lastly, research issues related to life support measures. This is very important because you're gonna have a whole different kind of um, verbiage within the ICU in regards to what life support measures are most of the time. Nurses need to be competent in the general understanding of what they mean. So we have do not resuscitate orders, refusal of treatment for religious preferences, advanced directives, withdrawing life-sustaining uh, procedures, just to name a few. So when in doubt, ask for help from another critical care nurse if you're unsure what these different things are, but read up and understand what each one of these are. Because sometimes you could have um, do not resuscitate orders, but it's like a limited DNR, meaning that they want chest compressions, but they don't want artificial ventilation. You're going to have to know what all of these things are in order to make sure that you're following what the patient's wishes are. As always, if you have any questions, you can leave them down below. I am not a legal professional. I am just giving you my personal experience with the legal system um, as I have worked in the medical field for the last 10 years. I hope that this information was helpful in understanding the different kind of legal and ethical issues that you're going to come in contact as you're working independently as a registered nurse, LPN, whatever the case may be, as some kind of healthcare professional. As always, if you have any questions, leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure you head over to my website at www.nursechung.com where there is a ton of additional resources in regards to helping you become successful in your critical care nurse journey. And as always, I will see you in my next video. Bye.